Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Exploring the Kintsugi Spirit, a panel discussion hosted by JACCC. Uh, my name is Ronnie DeLeon, and I'm the Director of Performing Arts at JACCC. And it's my uh, pleasure and honor to be here to moderate this panel. Um, I'd like to first thank Kimiko Mar and Caroline Kimura and JAMP for their invitation and great help in organizing uh, this discussion. Um, I'd like to start by introducing JACCC, uh, Japanese American Cultural and Community Center is a nonprofit organization founded in 1971, uh, based in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles. It's one of the largest ethnic arts and cultural centers of its kind in the United States. Um, our mission at JACCC is to weave Japanese and Japanese American arts and culture into the fabric of our communities. Uh, JACCC remains firmly rooted in Little Tokyo and provides a vital place to build connections between people and cultures locally and internationally. Um, through inclusive programs, we continue our traditions and nurture the next generation of innovative artists, culture bearers, and thinkers. Uh, so. Um, yeah, this year in response to the pandemic, JACCC commissioned five grant recipients of multiple creative disciplines to interpret the Japanese concept of kintsugi um, in a time when we felt there was a lot of issues that were um, bubbling up as a result of COVID-19, um, you know, whether uh, mental health uh, issues, climate change, racial discrimination, economic disparities, et cetera, we felt the concept of kintsugi had a uh, strong potential uh, as an approach uh, for dealing with some of these issues that seem to be um, exacerbating as a, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and we saw a great opportunity to consider a Japanese philosophy as an approach to how we might heal and mend uh, some of those breakages and, and disparities. Um, if you are unfamiliar with what kintsugi is, um, it is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with lacquer, dusted, or mixed with powdered gold. Um, even broader as a philosophy, it treats uh, breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to hide or disguise. Um, and to just go a little deeper on the philosophical side, um, it can be interpreted as um, highlighting or embracing imperfections, finding beauty in what is broken, um, and even uh, perhaps appreciating, uh, honoring, or celebrating these breakages as part of what makes something whole or complete. Uh, so through a um, request for proposals, JACCC invited artists to ponder this philosophy and to submit proposals interpreting Kintsugi as an approach to either uh, individual or collective healing and showcase their art through a final video. Um, we were met with a huge response of 135 plus proposals from all over the nation. And out of that 135, through a deliberation process, we chose only five uh, grant recipients to complete their proposed works. Um, and also I wanted to mention that during the art making process, we had the artists meet with our master artist in residence, Hirokazu Kosaka, who shared uh, various notions about uh, Japanese culture and philosophy, uh, which gave the artists an opportunity to integrate some of those ideas um, into their works. So uh, we are very lucky and fortunate today to be joined by all five grant recipients who I would love to bring in right now. Boom, 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 boom. There they are. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome this amazing group right here. It's my honor and privilege to be joined by them. Um, and they span a uh, multiple creative disciplines, which they will tell you about. Uh, but it, and before we begin, I just want to take this moment to thank all of them while they're all in the room for their exceptional work. Um, I honestly didn't expect to be so moved by all the stuff you guys created. So I can't wait for everyone to witness your completed works, uh, which will be premiering this Friday uh, for the world to see on the JACCC website. Uh, so it is quite a treat uh, to be talking with this group right now uh, before the premiere. Um, so yeah. Um, 
with no further ado, I'd like to jump out of the spotlight and give each of these artists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, maybe just for this introduction one, we could go in alphabetical order, which would put Andres first. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe just to start, if we could just share our name, uh, pronouns, if you'd like to share um, where you're from and your artistic medium and what kind of art you create. And, and we can start there. So Andres, please take it away. Okay, uh, you can all hear me well enough. Great. Uh, I really thought you were gonna go by last name because that would have put me last as in Vasquez, but you know, as Andres, I'm willing to go first. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for joining us and thank you Ronnie for bringing us all together. Um, yeah, my name is Andres Vasquez. Uh, I'm a writer and director from Los Angeles, California. I work primarily in film, but I do visual arts, photography, and uh, graphic design and some other elements. And yeah, my pronouns are uh, he, him, and they. And I'm really happy to be here and to be amongst uh, such talented artists. And I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone's work in completion. I think that would make Emily next, yes. Thank you, Ronnie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. I am 18, currently a senior in high school. I'm in Orange County, and um, I am a ballet and contemporary dancer. I've been training since I was six years old, and um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm really excited to see everyone's work and be amongst such amazing people. Uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I think I'm up. Um, I'm Erin Shigaki. I use she and they pronouns. I'm in Seattle, uh, otherwise known as unceded Duwamish territory. And um, I, I'm a graphic designer, I guess, by training. And now I've been doing public art and um, installation and other visual art. And I am really honored to be in this group. That means I'm next. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jen Long Johnson, she, her, they. I'm a biracial Cantonese white cisgender woman from Houston and Salt Lake City. And I'm currently living on the Eastern shore of Maryland in Salisbury, um, which are the traditional lands of the Wicomico and Nanticoke people. Um, and I am an MFA major. I'm getting my degree right now of dance in at uh, Montclair State University. and. Um, and I'm a choreographer and a screen dance artist. Hello, I'm Marielle Mays. My pronouns are she, her. I am from New York and I am coming to you from New York right now. Um, so I'm a musician, more specifically, I am a composer and a pianist. So composer and performer. Um, Piano is my primary instrument, and I tend to write the most for the piano since it um, is most accessible to me. But I also love writing for other instruments and was very excited to have the opportunity to be part of this wonderful group of people. Thank you, everybody. What a great group. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. And maybe for this one, we'll go backwards. Uh, so Meryl, you might be first. Um, but um, so we're gonna jump right in. I'd love for each of you to talk about uh, the proposals that you submitted to us. Um, you know, what was your proposal? Um, might even throw in there perhaps, what was it about Kintsugi that drew you in when you, when you saw this RFP pop up in your feed? Um, and how did you intend to um, interpret Kintsugi through your art and art making? So yeah, just maybe describe the proposal that you submitted and, and kind of what your concept was for your for your project. Um, so Mariel, if you could start, that would be great. Of course. So for this proposal and with the timeline that we were given, I knew that during this, this summer, I was going to be in Portugal, specifically in the northern part of the country of Portugal. And I had been there before and I had remembered that there were a ton of unused pianos lying around. And as more like an interesting hobby of mine, I tend to see like, oh, there's a piano, there's a piano. In all these random spaces perhaps, or when you walk into people's homes and somebody, when you say you're a pianist, they say, oh, I have this piano here, but I haven't touched it or used it since 
fill in what year or what time. And typically these pianos are um, considered a little nasty sounding, <laughs> less conventional sounding. They don't often sound like pianos and they're deemed unplayable to a lot of trained musicians, perhaps, especially. So my proposal for this Kintsugi project was to take the proposal and the concept of Kintsugi pretty literally in writing a new piece for broken pianos. And that is to take the sounds of a handful of pianos that are perhaps very, very out of tune, um, literally in pieces, fragmented and broken, or just that have not been touched in a very long time and using those sounds, pre-recording those sounds to create a new piece of music. So that was the original proposal and that's what ended up happening. I won't give away too much. I'll talk a little bit more about the outcomes of all of that in a bit. But um, to sum it up, I took the idea very literally of using broken pianos to create something new. And my personal style of composition often incorporates a lot of different genres. So I do come from a classically trained background, but have a lot of familiarity in jazz, in folklore, in musical theater, in the music of my own heritage as well, and of different cultures that I've learned within the last um, couple of years. So incorporating different genres of music into this new piece was important for me as well. Thank you, Mariel. And yeah, we'll get a little taste of that music in the trailer that we'll share at the end of this uh, discussion. I believe uh, Jen is next, I think. Yes. So my background is in dance and photography, and I also have, um, I'm a certified yoga teacher. So I have some of the healing arts in there as well. And I wanted to make a screen dance that was a representation of Kintsugi in metaphor and in structure. Um, so I focused my, the idea of the healing process as something that is neither finite or fixed, but impermanent, transient, and continual. Um, I'm, like I said before, I'm an MFA student at Montclair State University, and I've been studying the effects of trauma in the healing process, and it led me to the Japanese aesthetics, philosophies, and kintsugi, and I just thought it was a perfect metaphor for the healing process and for trauma. And as I dug deeper into the meanings and philosophy, philosophies surrounding the practice, I was drawn to the idea of ma, which is the Japanese um, idea of space and the potentialities within moments of space and the space between a moment of trauma or break and the arrival, I air quote arrival of healing that you get to this place where you're healed. Um, and I, I was drawn to the Kyoto Journal and it was, there's a poem on their website and they have a whole, a whole issue. I think they actually have two issues. One was I think in the eighties, but they just released a recent issue. Um, and it was all about this concept of Ma and of space, which is very, you know, prevalent right now in, during the pandemic that we're all experiencing. And but there was this poem that they had translated and it said, and I'm just gonna read it because it's really beautiful. Length of time depends on upon our ideas. Size of space hangs upon our sentiments. For one whose mind is free from care, a day will outlast the millennium. For one whose heart is large, a tiny room is as the space between heaven and earth. So as I was working with the idea of Ma, I was looking at the materials with Kintsugi that we fill spaces that we meet in life and how they determine the value of what is seen as a break and its strength and repair. So the screen dance that I created um, is a metaphor for the fractured self and how we fill the spaces of disconnection with something of value. And in this case, it's empathy. Um, it also re represents a relationship between two people or our relationship with the earth or within structures and a question that I thought was how do we give space for differences within self with others and then support fluidity and unity. And this idea of valuable material, it kind of came up in every aspect of the artwork. And a lot of the movement that I did with Katie and Marina who were the dancers in the screen dance, it centered around contact improvisation, which requires 
the people who are practicing um, to have a high level of empathy and to have somatic, I guess, attention and listening to each other. And it creates openness. And when they have that empathy, then they're able to, their movement flows. And all of these points kind of, it pointed to microcosmic connections within self and the idea that repairing and bringing cohesion between the layers of self is similar to how we might repair and bring harmony between layers of society, our roles as humans and, and as inhabitants on the earth. So this is why also sound was important in this screen dance. And my collaborator, Satya Hinduja, who was wonderful, she created what she called an alchemic ele electronica soundtrack. And it was tuned to 68.05 Hertz, which is the earth's primal frequency. Um, and so, Within this screen dance, you know, it expanded this resonance beyond self and into this macrocosmic connection that we have with everything that surrounds us. And yeah, I'm done. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jen. And every if it sounded at all abstract what she was sharing, I just have to say you executed it like beautifully. And it totally is all in that film, everything you just shared. So thank you. Um, Aaron. Wow, this is great because just so everyone in the audience knows, we haven't seen each other's work. <laughs> we do not know what it looks like, and I'm really excited. Um, so in my public artwork, I have mostly uh, told stories about my community, which is the Japanese American community. And primarily I have told stories about um, the World War II incarceration you know, because of its importance um, to us and, and to the country, you know, to, to the reckonings that we need to do and to the, the ties that we need to make to other stories. And so when I saw this call, I, I knew that I wanted to um, create some pieces that talked about the Japanese American story and the black story together. Um, and I thought I was gonna be, <laughs> Ronnie knows, I thought I was gonna do it in a more literal way, um, really uh, digging into the personal family history of a good friend of mine um, who is black. Um, and so like we kind of had all these plans to, to, to do the film, um, and, and I don't know how to make a film, but I have learned a lot in this process. And I guess we'll talk about that more in the next question. Um, but anyway, so the my work is around sort of two large paintings and telling a story um, that weaves them together. And I, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Erin. Um, Emily. I believe. Hello, yeah. Um, I forgot to mention, um, I'm also gonna be representing on behalf of Crystal Matsuyamatsai. Um, I partnered with her for this wonderful Kintsugi project. Unfortunately, she is not here today, but um, I loved working with her. I absolutely love working with her. And um, I would love to show or um, explain some of the things that we were talking about and how we came to um, decide to make this Kintsugi project together. So um, originally, uh, Crystal and I actually, before we found out about Kintsugi, after the Stop Asian Hate Movement and a lot of things are going on with COVID, the two of us um, talked to each other about potentially making some sort of Japanese American or Asian American um, project together as Japanese American uh, women during this time. And also I am Crystal's student and she is my mentor and teacher. And to have that kind of connection of the different generations um, that are coming together to create art together. So we actually had that in mind before. And then I found out about Kintsugi because I've always loved JACCC. And um, once I found this, I proposed to Crystal asking if she wanted to make this project or send in a proposal about um, the intergenerational trauma that we both were looking at and considering when we looked at our grandparents and specifically our grandmothers. So um, that's how we came to the idea of creating this short film of us choreographing and dancing to, um, or at least with the idea of dedicating it to our grandmothers 
with the sense of, um, because Kintsugi is supposed to be like also this concept of finding beauty in the brokenness and how we recognize that our grandmothers are broken from the effects of internment camps, um, but to also explore that connection that Crystal and I have on a personal level as well. And um, being able to express everything that, not everything because it can't entirely encapsulate the history, but um, for us to express our connection, our personal connection that Crystal and I developed in the studio as a student and a teacher through our, wonder, our wonderful passion of dance, but to also explore how the generational and Japanese American connection that cannot be formed in a studio um, bonds us more than just um, through movement as well. And um, so we came to the proposal and I've always wanted to take my grandmother back to Gila River, which was where she was interned. And through this project, I had the opportunity and privilege to actually bring her back there too, to film for this project. And um, yeah, I think that's the general idea of um, what we were going with. And um, uh, Kintsugi for us hits close to home after um, seeing a lot of discrimination that was happening during the time with COVID. And I felt like personally for me too, I felt like this, project gave me an opportunity to um, express the pain and also like the mornings of whatever I was feeling at the time while also finding a way to heal and connect with people I love through this process. Thank you, Emily. And shout out to Crystal. Were you here in spirit? Yes. Uh, Andres, please. Hi. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sharing. Um, yeah, as uh, Aaron had said, we don't know what the other people have done or other folks have done. So I'm really excited. And I saw stuff in the trailer. I'm like, ooh, that music sounds great. I believe that's Mariel's music, right? Is it? Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so the project proposal that I had submitted uh, kind of, you know, came about through a conversation with a friend. And uh, we just talked about talking to one another and how you know it's been a great hardship at this point in time in our lives, right? We're all sharing this moment of global pandemic and um, talking, talking to one another is really helpful. Uh, talking through traumatic pain, through hardship, through loss. I have a lot of friends and family that passed away within the past two years and I'm sure we all have experienced been touched by that tragedy. And you know what I found that really helped me and helped the individuals that I have these close relationships with it's just talking to one another, it's being seen. And uh, the idea really was generated out of, the, you know, what do you do with that language? Because, you know, you speak this broke this brokenness, like I had this terrible experience or this great hardship. But at the same time, paradoxically, it's like as you're saying this, you feel healed or you feel relieved or you feel like you're showing a piece of yourself or showing this other individual how you're mending yourself with these words, even just sharing that space. So I really wanted to focus on holding communal space for mourning and meditation. So the project that kind of came about was uh, Frequencies. And um, you know, it's a documentary or a multimedia documentary. Uh, it combines photography, uh, audio interview, and um, a generation of like a frequency wave created from the subject's uh, speech. And uh, you know, talking to, Hirokazu, uh, you know, thank you again so much, Ronnie, and to Hirokazu for really guiding us through this process. But he talked about this idea of, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican American, but he was talking about uh, this idea of, um, thank you for the shadows, this the idea of gradation, and I really that really hit me. He's like, yeah, you know, it's we, there's no binary, there's no black and white, it's all gray. And this just coincided with this quote I found from Carla Conejo Villavencio, who wrote The Undocumented Americans. And it just said, an open wound in this world, specifically for Latinx, has been the shame of darkness, our own and that of our family, neighbors, and compatriots. And it's something I really wanted to explore. So Frequencies is this documentary that explores loss within these respective individuals' uh, personal lives. It can be um, battling cancer, uh, the loss of a parent, or kind of going through the quote unquote brokenness of their narratives and their family's narratives and finding some kind of 
reconciliation for themselves. It's not always going to be a happy ending, but this idea of being seen and just celebrating or rather making that broken moment and that repair visible. So that's kind of what it is. I know it gets kind of a little strange, but uh, again, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. I had a great collaborator, uh, Anibal Sandoval, composer. And um, yeah, it just reminded me like what we do now with our artwork is going to speak to us several years from now. Like, What are we doing with our time? And I really wanted to create a space for people that I cared about, uh, family and friends, to have that space because we're not always afforded it. So I hope you all enjoy it. Um, yeah. So thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> thank you, Andres. Um, well, OK, this is great. Um, so uh, I thought it might be uh, helpful to get into a little bit of the art making process. And I wanted to give you all an opportunity to share a nugget or two about the art making process itself. Um, I'd like to ask if there was anything you would like to share uh, about perhaps new things you discovered about yourself or your art process, um, any challenges that you faced that you had to overcome, uh, perhaps anything that you picked up from uh, the guidance convenings with Hirokazu. Uh, so a really open-ended question and you can jump in like whatever comes comes to you in terms of the process itself that you would like to share about. Um, maybe we could start in the middle uh, of the alphabet with Jen, if that sounds okay. So, so yeah, and maybe we'll go alphabetically from there and back around the circle. <laughs> we'll figure it out. But um, yeah, uh, Jen, if you if you wouldn't mind just sharing whatever comes to mind about the process that you feel you'd want to share with the audience, um, please. Sure. Um, so a couple challenges uh, were, well, it was my first time working with a couple of the collaborators. And I think working, you know, with new collaborators, it requires a lot of honest, vulnerable communication to be able to share an intent clearly. And so not being able to be in the same space as the people that I was meeting with for the first time was challenging because you know, all of my collaborators, I'm in Maryland and Satya was in New York City and my sister, my, one of the dancers is actually my sister, Katie, um, but her and the other dancer, Marina, they were both in Salt Lake City and we were planning to film in Southern Utah. And so not being in the physical, in physical proximity of one another was really, it was kind of challenging, but, um, you know, I guess some details, you know, we had to figure them out and adjustments were made and there were a lot of moving pieces that needed to find a place. And so naturally, I felt like the entire process looked a lot like Kintsugi. And I just thought how interesting it was, you know, that there was that correlation within the process itself and how necessary it was to make adjustments and to make readjustments until things fit together well. And and really practicing empathy and practicing what I was exploring within my artwork and those opportunities that we filled spaces between the miles or conversations or um, between rehearsals. Uh, that was really, really helpful to put empathy there and humility and adaptability. Um, and also the land that we decided to film on, it was or that we filmed the screen dance was in unprotected land in Southern Utah. And, and so getting to those spaces was also a challenge and, you know, traveling there with all of our gear and, you know, and just the physical um, expression of dancing in a hot desert in the summer, it was like in July. Um, it was, it was a challenge to, to get there and to create the work there, but because the spaces that we were in, they're these really incredible cracks and spaces and um, within the earth that hold traditional sacred meaning to the indigenous people that were stewards of their particular land. It was so meaningful and it was really sacred to experience creating work there that focused on trauma and the healing process because we were in essentially traumatized land and this land itself is in the process of healing and that process is ongoing. Um, so something that really stuck with me from our talks with Hirokazu was this space between things. And he talked a lot about um, 
I guess, perception of space and the distance and whether it was time between the present moment and eternity, or it was verandas between gardens and buildings. Um, and something he said impressed my process and worldview of art making. And he said, by creating microcosms, we can embrace the bond with the macrocosm. And within this work, you know, he they mirror one another. The mi microcosm can extend to the micro macrocosm and the more we clearly see the connection and contrast between the two, the better we can place ourselves within that arrangement. Um, and one more thing, sorry, I don't want to talk too much. But, um, you know, about a week before I was meant to fly out to film the screen dance, uh, the ceramic artist I had commissioned for the piece of the film, her kiln ended up breaking. And in the film, I have an actual piece that gets uh, repaired. And so I was trying to find someone who might have something that would work or someone who had something available within Salt Lake City. That's where I was flying to. And um, and I had just amazing, incredible, wonderful friends and family and, and acquaintances and strangers who would call me and send me suggestions of, oh, call this person, they'll have something. Or I had my cousin drove down to some um, artists. Um, shop to see if they had something for me and um but we ended up finding an artist and it was a friend a dear friend's mother who made the pieces that we ended up using in the film and and that experience just kind of showed me that you know people coming together and empathy and compassion they helped to create this work and community was that gold that you know brought this particular work together so i'm done speaking thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jen. Um, wow, uh, Mariel, if you would be open to going next. Of course. So there were a lot of really wonderful things along this journey of creating um, the piece of music that I didn't expect. Um, I do, as I mentioned before, come from a more traditional Western music style of training that's how I was taught to play the piano how I was how I learned in school and universities um, where typically you notate a piece of music a new composition is notated and it's put down on paper and then it is performed um, that's kind of the idea I had in my head when I wrote this proposal which was okay sketch out what I want and then go to these pianos and try to do it and see what happens. And that is not at all what happened because I found these pianos that had such bizarre and unique sounds to them that it changed the whole scheme. It changed my whole original sketch because I thought, oh, I was so smart. I'm going to plan this ahead of time. And that, of course, didn't work. Um, and when I say didn't work, nothing worked. So if you can imagine, if you're familiar with the notes of a piano, for example, and I said, okay, well, I want something to revolve around E flat and B flat, perhaps. You play an E flat and B flat on one piano and it doesn't really sound like that. You play it on another piano and it sounds like one of the pianos you'll see in the video, it has almost a gamelan type bell-like sound to it because it hasn't been used in so long that you can't even recognize it as a piano anymore. And even though when I wrote this proposal, that was in my head to use these sounds, but it didn't hit me until I actually heard the instruments in front of me. Um, and then I started thinking, well, of course, I'm just gonna find the weirdest notes on all of these pianos. And I just started recording, okay, which key sounds the belliest? I don't have the best adjectives, but if you can imagine something that's very ringy, if you're in a closed wooden space and you play this note very loudly, it's gonna be kind of twangy on the ears, a little uncomfortable. And I recorded the most uncomfortable sounds to me on three pianos in particular. Um, and then from there, it was a bit like Kintsugi, a little bit like piecemealing things together and figuring out how am I going to put together the notes that no longer sound like notes. Also using the body of the instrument, these wooden pieces that 
have tons of resonance. Um, so even similar to a piece of ceramics that has this inner space, like a negative space, the piano does the same. The ringiness and the beauty of any piano comes from the negative space and the structure of it. So all of these pianos have different structures. They were made in different places. The wood is changed by the climate constantly, whether it was touched a day before or not. So the process changed completely. And furthermore, <laughs> recording a passage, let's say, I'll just use a more traditional term, some sort of musical phrase on these instruments. I would play it on a Tuesday and you try it again on a Friday, and after a couple of days of having rained, and then the sun comes in, and then I opened the lid for the first time on this piano in 20 years, it sounded different from Tuesday to Friday. And I have to had to decide which recording am I going to use? Okay, what do we do now? How do we change the structure of this whole piece? Um, and that was extremely challenging and fun, especially for somebody that's used to okay, you write it on a piece of paper and it's set. This was hearing the sounds and how they're changing over time and really coming to terms with this final product is, is a snapshot of this moment in time. And of course, all music, I think, and all art is a snapshot of the moment in time. But for me, literally, this was, this is not a piece that I could ever recreate on a different day, on a different instrument, or even on the same instruments ever again, because the sounds will be that different. So that's a little bit about um, the process of, of all of this. Um, and other things that really struck me, especially from the workshops with Hirokazu, um, ideas of framing and how we frame the small things, even if we don't understand the full product, if we, are looking at fragments of things in a certain with a certain lens, eventually we'll start to see a more complete picture. Um, and that came into play with the videography of the piece as well. Thank you, Mariel. Uh, there's something so kintsugi about what you shared, like how the tuning changes. I did read how practitioners, when they're working on a piece, like they may put a piece in and then they come back to that piece the next day and something shifted. So they have to constantly kind of massage and adjust and every piece that they work on is unique in itself. So that's perfect. Um, Andres, if you are open to going next, that would be awesome. I, I am. I am also wondering how we skipped. Oh. <laughs> we're we're oh, doing wait. a circle. Oh, okay, I see, I see. I don't know if we're going by first or last name. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you all for sharing. That's really, that's really cool, Mariel and Jen. Uh, improvise, move forward. Um, very cool. Uh, yeah, for my experience um, about the process, something that I learned was, and something I picked up from Hirokazu, which really resonated with me, it kind of shifted everything for me, like everything. Um, his story of, um, learning how to do archery from his father about shooting yourself or shooting the arrow to uh, kind of kill your ego uh, really impacted how I went through this very intimate process of interview um, with the subjects in frequencies. Um, you know, killing the ego or taking out your ego is taking out judgment and kind of being there to experience. And, you know, as you're recording interviews, it's just to allow things to kind of exist in their space and to have them reveal themselves to you as opposed to imposing a narrative, right? And trying to like, hey, well, my ego says, I really wanna do this. You know, I need you to cry now, or I need you to, to you know, do this nugget and like construct a story. Um, it really taught me to be patient and to kind of sit there while, with, you know, respective friends and um, move through the conversations with that kind of um, temperament. Some of the difficulties, I think, I mean, the greatest difficulty is, um, is holding space is, you know, I'm not, we're not objective artists. 
or, or objective filmmakers. You, you try to do that to let things come forward, but to hear the stories, to hear the individual's personal experiences, it's 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 difficult. It's difficult to hold that. And I think the process of, you know, Kitsugi is looking at the repair, is really looking at the breaks and kind of being there. Uh, I love what Mariel said about the piano being this vessel. And I'm like, oh, shoot. When you create space, you're creating a vessel between two people. You now the breaks in the conversation, the breaks in the dialogue, I mean, that becomes part of it. And, I, um, you know, I just feel really grateful to be a part of that. And just, you know, as I kind of informed Ronnie, um, I kind of understood the responsibility of recording individuals. Um, one of the subjects, uh, Natalia Provatas, uh, was, was a very close friend. And um, she passed away about a week and a half ago. And I, I kind of understood what it meant to use your art to hold space, to document your community, to provide an opportunity to share in that narrative. And, you know, it didn't hit me. I, I understood, I, like to intellectualize it, I understood at the moment, like, oh yeah, this is, this is a moment. But it's not until the project is finished and you witness it and you hear it over and over again, you see these repairs, that you understand the impact of that. And I think uh, one of the subjects, did, a dialogue piece didn't make it into the piece, but he just said, you know, being compassionate or being empathetic is not just recognizing how an individual feels, but attempting to do something to alleviate that pain or to understand that pain further. So I think it really communicated to me exercises and empathy and what it means to hold space. So um, yeah, that, that was my experience. But I think, you know, the inevitability of all these things, it's just about accepting those truths. And there's so many beautiful things that uh, Natalia shared. And she was a beautiful and talented person. And, you know, her just her being lives with every person that she's touched, and especially myself. And it's just redefined how I kind of move through the world and how we create, or I say we myself uh, create, and I don't think I'll ever be the same. And I think that's kind of what Kintsugi is about, right? You're not gonna be the same, but it's highlighted. And so like, I was like getting emotional, but now it's just like, I don't know what she repaired in me. And it's, it's not kind of cheesy, but, like it, it really is that because everything changed. Everything's changed for me. And yeah, that that was kind of the process. Thank you so much, Andres. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, Emily, if you would like to go next. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing to uh, the past three that just did. Um, yeah, I'm so yeah, just uh, I'm so sorry for your loss, Andres. But um, and I'm really touched by what everyone else had to say as well. Um, I guess for what Crystal and I had for our project, experience-wise, was we had. Um, sort of a swapping of experiences and expectations when doing this. I did forget to mention for our project, um, I went to Arizona to go film um, at the same area or spot. I'll go more into the details of the spot later of um, where my grandmother was held in the internment camps when she was young, while Crystal actually went to her grandmother's backyard and filmed there. And that was supposed to have this idea of like an interconnected time um, to also show that generational healing and also generational trauma is, um, I guess, expressed through that video of us being in two different locations and having movements that connect the two of us. And something that Hirokazu uh, mentioned that I feel like really resonated with Crystal and I was, I guess, I mean, not necessarily like what he said, but it was more like the integrity in which he continues to hold throughout his approach to his work, but also like how he holds such fascination within the way he sees the world. And we wanted to also take that and, and 
use that as inspiration with how we see dance and how we see how dance connects us to our past. And we wanted to use similar to kind of what Jen said with the whole like dance and means of expression um, and like how abstract movement can tell the story of a person's complicated emotions. And dance is a gray area as well. So we wanted to take that art and um, use that to hope uh, to express everything that we talked about before. But um, personally, when I went to Gila River, I had a lot of experiences as well that uh, were kind of unexpected. Um, it was a lot more emotional than I thought too. And um, I went to Gila River, which is a an uh, indigenous people's Native American reservation land. So we weren't actually able to get onto the land. And um, we, my dad and I were looking for a lot of different locations to potentially film outside the border. We tried like six different locations. We did our own trip to go and find our way into the area, but we never actually found um, a way to get ourselves onto the land for various reasons, such as COVID, but also that it, it is a Native American reservation land. And at the time it was first um, kind of a, a panicking sensation of, oh shoot, am I gonna get myself on this land? But then the more I thought about it, I thought it was really symbolic. And I gained a lot more respect for Native Americans in this process as well. But the whole idea of I can't get onto a land of oppression on top of a land of oppression because of internment camps being on that reservation land. And I also wanted to make this connection between bringing my grandmother there and Gila River in itself. I was never... I never was able to get my grandmother to fully open up through this process. And I know the concept of Kintsugi is supposed to be like finding the beauty and the brokenness, but also finding a way of collective healing. And I do feel as if what I did with this project and filming and dancing for her and dedicating this stuff to her does, did open things up. I still felt like it didn't open her up entirely. And I felt like this whole experience of going to Gila River and filming there too, and not actually getting myself on the land as well, was almost like Gila River was a representation of my grandmother in the sense that I couldn't really get her to fully open up, even if I got her really close. And um, I even said, I even had an experience with, um, I mean, I when I brought her over there, there was a point where she did cry. And even with her cry, I still felt like she was crying on behalf of Japanese Americans at a distance then from her personal life and from her personal self, almost as like a defense mechanism. And that really struck me in the core too. And um, I feel another thing that really struck me, I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but um, was that we went to visit a train station as well afterwards. And that train station was actually burned down. And that train station was um, supposed to be where the Japanese Americans boarded for them to go to internment camps like Gila River and they were packed um, without food and water and it was really it was a dehumanized uh, dehumanizing process but the burned down station was completely forgotten there was no proper memorial whatsoever or care for the ruins and I felt like that was also a representation of the racism and the generational pain that was within that area that's still there and um yeah, and um, I guess with with connecting with Crystal through this project of time and healing, um, I think I was able to connect with my grandmother more than any other time in my life. I got to know her so much better through this process of Kintsugi as much as I also realized how broken she is, but then also finding how that brokenness is something that I admire as well with her resiliency and her persistence in life. And um, I also felt like through this process that I learned so much more about myself as well. And I think that's something that I will always be grateful for and really thankful for. And I really appreciate this Kintsugi project and the opportunity I got to explore that. Thank you, Emily. And thank you for pushing through all of those challenges along the way. You kept me updated on them all and I appreciate you just knocking them out one by one. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, Erin, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. I love hearing stories about grandparents, survivor, survivors of this experience, especially. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I only started doing public art a few years ago and I feel like I come at it as a historian 
just as much as I do, you know, from an artistic standpoint. And so I was really stuck in that mode when I came into this project <clears throat> and, um, you know, it was, was, you know, my first cut of the film was this, you know, very like almost interviewee, you know, history lesson. Like these are the things that have been erased about this history. And I was totally planning on having my friend, Chris, who lives in Philadelphia, kind of like take the same approach. And it was gonna be like the most boring thing ever, you know, like two talking heads. Um, and so, you know, I had these very good meetings with Ronnie where he had, you know, collected all the thoughts uh, from Hirokazu and Pat, and I don't know who else, um, where, you know, I also um, received the same lesson um, that Andres received from Hirokazu, but in my case, he, he phrased it as kill your children, <laughs> you know, kill the ego. You, you know, turn away from this approach that you are so um, hung up on and and try to stretch yourself, you know, um, because I didn't have a problem um, making the visual art, even though it was it was new for me to kind of combine um, large wheat pasted images with painting. But, but what was really new was just trying to make a film and just think about every single part of it. Um, so, you know, I was, I was just stressed out about trying to do the right thing and then just get off of the track that I had started on. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, and it turned out great, you know, it, like, I really appreciated the notes. I had to ask for help from a bunch of people. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's, that's part of my brokenness, right? Like this, like, I've got to do it by myself. I know I can do it, you know? Um, so, so I think that, that a lot of the, the Kintsugi lessons, you know, imparted themselves through, through the way that I kind of fumbled toward the final project. And, um, you know, and it, it didn't turn out to be as literal a story um, as I wanted to be, but it's more um, kind of an offering to the, to the Black, to the African-American community um, and a suggestion to the Japanese-American community that, um, you know, that our solidarity can be really powerful in this moment when um, reparations is on the table for Black folks. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for sharing that. We had a very fulfilling process, and I really appreciate your openness uh, as we move through that journey. Um, I know we're kind of getting short on time, but I did want to give you all um, an opportunity to um, perhaps just share one last thing that is um, resonating with you about the philosophy of, of Kintsugi. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on how perhaps uh, Kintsugi has been, uh, you've, you've been able to apply it to your own lives or perhaps how it can be applied um, as a way to perceive or engage with the world. Um, pretty open-ended again, but if uh, this one could be more open, if anyone wants to kind of share any uh, tidbits, that would be amazing. Um, uh, let's see, anyone wanna, yeah, Erin, go for it. I, I just, I'll say that um, I've been working with uh, three young adults who um, are formerly houseless on a mural project and um, I was sharing with them, you know, about the Kintsugi project and about the process and they were so enthralled with it and just got it right away. And so we've taken um, 
Kintsugi into our final mural that we're working on right now. So I just thought I would throw that out there. And I, I, I do work iteratively, so it was top of mind. And I was, I was pretty happy that um, these young artists really grasped onto it as well. Thank you. I saw Andres raise his hand, I think. Yeah, I, I can go. Um, something that I learned in from the project and just the, the art of Kintsugi is the idea of um, acknowledging breaks, right? Acknowledging breaks, uh, the vulnerability that it requires to acknowledge those breaks and the kind of, you know, the strength it requires to repair and to mend the artistry it really does uh, require to repair and creativity. You know, there's the literal, which you actually put gold. And then there's like the figurative, which is like this individual kind of crafting through the creativity, looking at the pieces and finding, you know, which pieces go together. Where do you file down? Where does the kind of beauty or celebration or gildedness really thrive that kind of helps strengthen that identity? So yeah, there's there's a lot of lot of gems that were taken from the experience, and you know, as a filmmaker, as a writer director, I'm doing a workshop right now. Just every time like someone asks me a question, like I go back to these interviews, and like this is this is, they gave they provided they shared a roadmap through that vulnerability, and how much repair I'm discovering that I can kind of do, and I'm hoping folks discover that as well. But yeah, I'm just you know. Big lesson, the vulnerability, acknowledgement, and understanding that it takes a lot of uh, creativity and strength to repair that, and artistry. Thank you, Andres. Yeah, that vulnerability really emanates from your piece, so I can't wait for people to uh, to see that. Uh, Jen. Um, I was just thinking how, after learning about and applying all the principles and philosophies, I too, I just saw how I guess I could see Kintsugi and everything too, and the process of my art making and the process of healing and the effort that other people were giving to fix structures that aren't working anymore, um, bridging social, economic, racial, racial um, cultural divides and uh, reparations that are being made, the physical space people had to navigate through the pandemic, and also, you know, um, like Andres was saying, an individual's intent to make amends or forgive their self and others and how, I guess for myself, it just inspired compassion to see other people and to understand that they might have cracks and breaks that are not visible, that haven't been repaired and um, they're not visible on the surface, but they're still there and that everybody essentially is in the process of something a process of growth or learning or a flux of change. Thank you. Jen. I can, oh, sorry, <laughs> but I can, I can keep going and jumping right in that um, similar to what everyone's been saying. Um, you don't know how what you're displaying is going to affect somebody else, of course. And, I think even though the concept of Kintsugi things are broken and then things are repaired, I think also something that resonates me with me a lot is that it's then displayed. It's then saying, this is, this is for you to see. It's not for me to fix anymore. It's not for me to put together. It's for you to see. Um, and I think we're all literally doing that by saying, this is a video, this is for you to see. But um, I think we're all sensing, feeling that other people have seen what we've been doing and been seeing this process and inquiring about it. And that's also part of it all um, on a super small scale. The instruments that I was using um, came from four generations of a particular family and having them ask me like, what are you doing? <laughs> that was really actually such an important part of the work and even showing them snippets like, this is what this sounds like now. This is what, you know, we put together and this is how it's in the video, showing them little pieces of that along the way and having them say like, I remember my 
mother's first piano lesson on, or I saw a picture of my mother's first piano lesson on that piano. And now it's being used for something completely different. It, it, it's all about perspective, right? And sharing things like that. And not to get ahead, but I just saw an interesting question that popped up in the chat as well of what kind of vessel were you before and what are you now? I would say before maybe I was just a road. <laughs> it was a straight line. And now I feel more like a vessel in general, not even a kind of vessel, but something that hopefully can be continually filled by all this. Emily, did, thank you, Mariel. Um, did you want to share something, Emily, on that? Um, or, yeah. Sure. Um, for me, I guess, um, I guess something that really resonated with uh, me about Kintsugi was just the complicated idea of, um, even in the darkest of moments, like, there's still things that you can recognize that are beautiful, like, even in horrible concepts. Because I know, I mean, like, racism and generational pain for me, like seeing with um, the whole internment camp process was notably really horrible. But through that, I was able to gain like a sense of Japanese American community and also like just a sense of deep family bonds that I always kind of took for granted. And um, because I feel I'm being 17, I guess I know I haven't really lived too much of my like life into adulthood yet but um i feel like taking that later on in the future and recognizing and really after this project i feel like i would connect so much more with my ancestors who um i know suffered and also through the idea and concept of gaman that i admire as well um and how i guess recognizing the japanese american community family that i have and the bond and how that is going to keep me going with whatever work that needs to be done later with regarding like social justice or like what to do to better myself as a person um, and as a woman of color as well. And um, having dance as a way to use and express that. And I just, I, I guess that's the main idea that I was kind of going with uh, resonating with me. Um, yeah. Thank you, Emily. Um, wow, I'm like really tripping on the range here, but how somehow it's all connected. Um, it's awesome. Um, I know we're kind of over time. Uh, may I ask the artist if, if anyone has to like cut soon, just so I could, because um, I do see some questions coming in and I did want to um, try to touch on some of them while we have uh, a little more time with you all. Um, I see uh, a question here about how were the artists chosen to be part of this project. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did an application process through a request for proposals. Um, we had 135 uh, applications submitted um, and we had an internal panel at JECCC uh, and through a arduous deliberation process, um, we uh, basically uh, chose these five artists based on the proposals that they submitted, uh, we found something very unique about what each of them shared and we really were inspired by um, the, their ideas. And so we kind of, uh, yeah, just kind of really loved their, their concepts and, and, and this is how this uh, group was, was chosen. Um, I see a question here, did you, uh, how did you take care of yourself in the process as an artist dealing with potentially triggering topics, themes and experiences how do you sustain, sustain yourself as an artist engaging with such themes? Um, does anyone wanna um, throw something in on that question? Um, how did you all take care of yourselves um, in this process? Emily, thank you. This is um, more of the personal journey because I know I am representing Maison Crystal too as well. But for me, when I went to Gila River, um, I actually went with my cousins. So I went with um, Ethan and Audrey are the names and they helped me a lot with this project as well. And um, I felt like when I was with them, I 
not only had a lot of fun as I mean, us close cousins were, but for me, there was also a moment where I lost it too, um, through this emotional process. And, um, I felt like, my cousins were there because they felt it as well. They felt the pain because they were also a part of this family bond that, and the family and pain that we were all feeling together. But I felt like having them beside me to feel that pain as well, wasn't like detrimental to our health because I felt like we had each other to recover from that, to pull ourselves out of the dark hole that we could have spiraled into um, without losing the opportunity to feel our emotions for us to really explore everything that we were feeling in that moment without losing anything, but without losing ourselves, um, to the point where there's no going back, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Anyone else want to jump in on that? All right. Oh, um, Andres. I, I, oh. yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, um, both individuals I was speaking to, it's interesting because uh, what the Albert, who's the male subject, he's one of seven, I'm one of seven. We're both the youngest of our family. Families come from the same town in Mexico. So it's really bizarre. We're probably related down the line. So he was talking about his, his mother and father and it was really, it was really bizarre to see him going through this process that I had experienced like several years before. Uh, but, you know, you know, it's in terms of death, in terms of abuse, in terms of all these different things that we're talking about. Um, I just kind of like attach the five remembrances. You know, I'm sure to become old, I'm sure to become ill, I can't avoid this. And, you know, I'm sure like I am the nature of dying I'm the nature of like, you know, being separated from my loved ones. And I just kind of not accepted in a way where it's submission well there is that but um the work is in serve is in service of something greater and that it, it has to be done kind of i mean that sounds like very heroic I, I feel like it's something that you know the nature of kitsugi asks that of us right to go into the hardship to go into the breaks and if it feels that way then i'm going in the right direction I'm, it's it's leading me into the right direction. So I kind of held on to like, you know, the five remembrances, something my friend Albert practices a lot. Um, and then just understanding that the hardship is part of the work. Um, and to take care of myself is, uh, yeah, just to kind of like, again, meditate on the thought of like, of being grateful, of being grateful. And then knowing that I, I have an ability to be in service of others. And that was very, very helpful. So, you know, that's that's the kind of way I took care of myself. Thank you, Andres. And yeah, again, as as you mentioned, like the weight of what you put together and the timeliness of it is 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 huge. Um, and that's gonna be there. Uh, so so honored to give that opportunity to to record that that uh, what you what you have in there. So thank you. Um, um, um let's see i don't know if we're going to get to all of these i think we kind of touched on how this thing knowledge moving forward here's one that i think mariel touched on which maybe someone can jump in on um what vessel were you before and via kintsugi what vessel are you now um perhaps how has uh i'm not gonna reiterate that does anyone want to Jump in on that one. What vessel were you before? And via Kintsugi, what vessel are you now? Any takers? I'll, oh, go ahead, Jen. I was going to jump in. But Jen, go ahead. You can go ahead, Andres, if you want to. <laughs> OK. Well, I was just thinking, you know, I think that at least within my film, I really wanted to create a different representation of healing. You know, this idea of Kintsugi that once it's done, it's done. And I don't know if I am any specific kind of vessel. And if anything, I'm just something that's continually changing. And and I think that's the beauty of this, that, you know, these actual physical vessels are these unchanged things. I mean, they're they're completely different than what they were before. 
but once they're healed, once they're put back together, that's it. But as a human, as a, as a physical person, that it's not quite so finite, you know, it's something that's more impermanent and continually shifting. So I'm a vessel that has no, it's infinite, a shape that's continually changing. Oh, thank you, Jen. Um, I was gonna say, uh, before the project, the vessel I was is some kind of like strainer, <laughs> like, you know, for pasta or something, you know, sometimes as an artist or as a filmmaker, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm tackling the hard issues. I'm tackling the real breaks. You kind of falsify that you're carrying and, you know, going through this process, I do feel more of something that retains water or like retains that actually is mended that actually has shape as opposed to being this kind of, um, not over idealistic, not that I was, but in the, like Hirokazu says, kill the ego and then you'll see the real work. You'll see the real shape of things. So I feel like something might've been a shadow object of myself or a shadow vessel. It doesn't quite have all the capacity of a physical object. And it became the actual shape of that afterwards. Or I'm working on becoming that shape. I don't want to be, I don't know if Hirokazu is going to come at me. So <laughs> No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, that's that's how I feel. Thank you, Andres. Um, so yeah, we're we're hitting close to 15 minutes over. I know this group can see some of the questions there. Before we get to the outro, is there any last thoughts um, um, that you want to share on some of the questions that you're seeing or anything, final words that you'd like to throw in uh, before we... Uh, in this session, anyone want to say last things? Yes, Jen, thank you. Um, just in regard to the question, whether we were given parameters for creating our art or given carte blanche, I really appreciated feeling supported by the JACC, by Ronnie, by Hirokazu, that we were given, you know, this open ability to create the work that was calling to us and came through us. And that was incredibly liberating and supportive and so and i'm guessing by everybody's nodding heads it was similar for everyone else absolutely second that jen and to add also thank you to ronnie and jccc for choosing such um a, something that is so topical and something that i think a topic that we feel very close to these days and that I think we were all ready to pour our whole selves into. So thank you for that. Sweet. Um, well, yeah, uh, thank you to this group. Um, and I just say that if I have any breakages in me, you all have filled that with with gold through this process. So I really appreciate this this group. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really excited to have the world see these pieces that you all have created. Um, if I could just briefly share um, how to find it, it's going to be um, at jaccc.org slash kintsugi. And uh, we have all the videos set to premiere at, on Friday at 9 a.m. And the uh, virtual exhibition will be uh, running from October 1st to October 31st, the month of October, on the JACCC website. So for anybody watching this, please tell uh, your people. Um, thank you to JAMP for putting the link in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, really excited for you all to experience this uh, virtual exhibition. Um, I think that was it. Um, yeah, so once again, um, thank you to Kimiko JMP for this platform to uh, share and for the artists uh, to get to know these artists a bit more. I definitely wish we had more time. And I, I, that was one regret that we didn't have more time to kind of get to know each other through the process. So. We're making that we're making that adjustment if this ever happens again. Um, but I, I do uh, honor and appreciate everybody in this group. 
you guys have been amazing for this first go around um, on this project. So uh, it, it turned out way better than we uh, ever expected. So I think we are going to end this um, with the trailer. Uh, so um, thank you again to everybody for uh, joining us today. And we will uh, <laughs> say goodbye for now. And um, please enjoy the trailer that Kimiko is going to queue up in just a second. And we will see you all uh, somewhere soon. All right. Kimiko. Bye.